Okay, we are now recording, and I've got all my stuff open. Welcome to session number eight of uh, Genesis in Depth. This is a, a study of uh, the book of Genesis beyond the basics. Uh, we're, uh, we're going beyond the, uh, uh, the outline layer study that we normally do in an introduction to the Old Testament. Uh, and looking at uh, uh, these chapters in uh, some more detail. Today we'll be getting into uh, chapter 5 and the first few verses of chapter 6 of, uh, of Genesis. Uh, chapter 5 lays out uh, the genealogy from Adam to Noah. Uh, this is what we call the pre-flood patriarchs. Uh, yeah, it is very, very interesting. Uh, there are some uh, enormous difficulties in the chapter, some of which I'm not even going to attempt. Uh, and uh, there's uh, some theological significance to this. Uh, one of the real big issues of chapter five is uh, the amount of time that's covered. Uh, so we'll get into all of that. Uh, and uh, uh, I'll, I'll see if I can make some sense of, of some of the technical stuff that's uh, going on in the chapter. In uh, chapter six, of course, we see the introduction to the narrative of the flood. And those first eight verses of chapter six uh, are extremely important in understanding the, the nature of the judgment that is the flood. Uh, to, to what extent is this thing a worldwide catastrophe or could we conceivably understand it as a local flood in mesopotamia or the jordan river or somewhere in philadelphia area <laughs> you know I, is there a is there a way to understand it at less than what the bible indicates and as we get into that chapter we'll we'll see uh, what God was really intending to do. Uh, another thing that uh, is, is probably worth mentioning as we approach all of this is that some of the elements that we've been studying so far are really discouraging. Uh, the, uh, the introduction of sin into the world so quickly uh, is um, disappointing. It would have been nice uh, if people had waited for a while. <laughs> well, it seems like the story begins with the sin problem, uh, and then we spent the whole rest of the Bible solving that problem. Uh, that's deliberate, of course. Uh, God knew what would happen, and he knew the timing. Uh, and the story itself uh, is uh, designed for our good, is designed for our encouragement. Uh, but let's work through it. We'll uh, get that share started. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Yes, there it is. Okay, pre-flood patriarchs. Here we go. Uh, what I've got here in the background uh, is the... Uh, a thing called the uh, Sumerian King List. Uh, this is actually written in Akkadian. It's a uh, it's a translation, if it can be called that, uh, of an original Sumerian doc uh, document. Uh, we have the original Sumerian King List only in uh, some fragments. Uh, so we know that this is what it is, uh, but uh, this uh, this is a uh, a story that was current very 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 early. We we have uh, evidence that this dates back to uh, well prior to 2000 BC. It's probably much older than that. Uh, uh, Abraham would have known about this story. Uh, the Sumerian 
uh, King list is a list of 10 heroes uh, who lived a very long time, on the average of 25,000 years. Uh, their, uh, their lifespans were not identical, but were really, really long. Uh, and they are listed in uh, even numbers. So 25,000 years exactly, or 27,000 years, or uh, 19,000 years in, uh, <laughs> in each case. The, the 10 include uh, some characters that we know about outside of uh, the Sumerian king list and are probably actual kings uh, of Sumer uh, at some point or another in their early history. Uh, the, um, uh, the various kings uh, often lived at the same time so they were very famous people, lived a very long time, uh, and um, uh, did all kinds of outlandish things like um, uh, destroying dragons and traveling to the center of the earth and such things. Uh, anyway, that's the Sumerian king list. Uh, there are some uh, scholars out there, I'm not among them, uh, who believe that uh, the Bible simply copies the Sumerian king list. Uh, they believe a thing like that, I, I suspect, because they've never read the Bible. I, I don't know. Maybe they have, uh, but haven't looked at it carefully. The differences between the Sumerian king list and the pre-flood patriarchs of chapter 5 are profound. Uh, the... Uh, uh, the Sumerian king list is obvious mythology. It doesn't pretend to be history. It's, uh, it's meant to uh, puff up the political history of the Sumerians. Uh, yeah, there's there's no, no effort at teaching anything true in the, in the Sumerian king list. The uh, uh, pre-flood patriarchs of chapter 5 of Genesis reads like history. Uh, we get, uh, uh, we get uh, numbers down to the ones place. Uh, we get uh, ages uh, that are uh, realistically different from one another. If you add up all of the, uh, all of the years, you, you find out that the entire uh, progression in our uh, English Bibles and in our Masoretic text is about 1,650 years from the creation to the beginning of the flood. Um, and we're going to talk about that number here in just a moment, but that's a, that's a realistic number. That's the kind of number that happens in history. Uh, the... Uh, Sumerian king list uh, assumes many, many, many hundreds of thousands of years for the kingdom of Sumer. And that simply isn't true. Uh, Sumer lasted a few hundred years uh, and was surpassed by uh, Akkad and the Akkadian culture of Babylon. Uh, so the Sumerian king list is mythology. The a uh, king list of chapter uh, 5 of Genesis, however, reads like history and probably ought to be understood as history. The genealogies in the Bible are meant to be understood as a framework for, uh, for historical thinking. The ancient Israelites used uh, genealogies and actually treasured them uh, as the uh, uh, the core uh, pegs on which to hang all of the rest of their history. Uh, so uh, genealogies were treated uh, with a certain amount of reverence uh, and still are. Uh, the genealogies that we have in Genesis are particularly important because often they point to the only historical pegs we have uh, for that portion of the Old Testament. 
prior to Abraham, it's it's difficult to come up with really good dates. And the genealogies of chapter 5 and chapter 11 actually give us hard dates all the way back uh, to the creation. Uh, and we'll be talking about the uh, the length of, uh, of these things along the way. Uh, let's see here. Let's, let's read a little bit. Uh, we'll get started in verse 1, chapter 5 of Genesis. This is the book of the generations of Adam. Okay, that's another of those Toledot passages. And I'm not going to belabor the structure, but Ela Toledot. These are the generations, or this is the book of the generations of Adam. Now, what this phrase means here is, now here is what comes after Adam. This is probably the beginning line of a separate origins document that was in, included in a gradually expanding collection that was passed down from one generation to the next of um, uh, the godly line. Okay? We don't know uh, who originally began telling the story in uh, chapter 5. We know that prior to this, we have the we have chapter 1 and into chapter 2, uh, the original creation story. We have the second creation story, uh, uh, and we have the fall, uh, and immediately after that, the expansion of sin. Uh, so this is the third of the Toledot passages. Uh, the, the first two uh, appear to have been written or first recited uh, by Adam. Uh, I would say, uh, although uh, his uh, uh, he would have been old enough, certainly, to still be alive for all of the events of chapter 4. Uh, by the time we get to chapter 5, we're, we're looking at somebody from the era of Noah who could look back and record all of this. Now, there would have been records kept all along the way. Uh, we're, we're seeing careful records. So this is how it starts. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day when God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. So there we have the, uh, uh, the in the beginning God portion of this chapter. It's almost a restatement of the creation. Verse 2 continues it. He created them, male and female, and he blessed them and named them man, Adam, in the day when they were created. Uh, so this attributes uh, a, a creation to the human race, to mankind, if you will. Uh, and uh, it, it gives us a, 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 a sense of the ties between this chapter and the very beginning. Uh, it's the uh, is written by a different author. You can you can feel in the Hebrew text uh, a a difference in the in the tone and in the uh, uh, the sort of approach to writing. Uh, this is the first genealogy in the Bible, uh, so it it serves as a format. And we're going to see the same format in chapter eleven when we get to that one. So the maleness and femaleness is uh, emphasized. Uh, he'll notice this about the Bible. The Bible is not the slightest bit woke. <laughs> yes. The, the Bible uh, uh, and the Bible's authors and uh, the creator himself uh, know that there are two sorts of people, boy-type people and girl-type people, uh, and there, there's never any hesitancy in the Bible at all. 
So anyway, when Adam had lived 130 years, he became the father of a son in his own likeness, according to his image, and named him Seth. Now, the first thing to notice, uh, which I really like here, uh, Adam became the father of a son in his own likeness. The likeness and image, same language uh, that uh, Genesis uses to describe Adam being created in the image and likeness of God. So he passed on to Seth that same image. Uh, now, Seth, as you'll recall from chapter 4, is a replacement for uh, Abel. Abel was the firstborn. Cain comes next. Uh, and uh, when Cain killed Abel, uh, we see the replacement in Seth. And so Seth is the beginning, then, of the godly line. Uh, and I find it uh, interesting and uh, difficult uh, that uh, Adam was 130 years old when uh, he became the father of Seth. Um, we're not told we're not told all kinds of things. Uh, and, uh, we shouldn't demand to know things that we're not told, I suppose. But I still wonder. Uh, we wonder uh, why it took so long, <laughs> you know, 130 years. Uh, why didn't they have a whole bunch of other children? And the, the fact is, we don't know. Uh, Adam and Eve may have had other children, but Seth is the one who counted. I'm not sure why that would be true. Uh, uh, Cain married a woman and began building cities back in chapter 4 uh, with uh, offspring of a variety of sorts. Uh, and the ungodly line of Cain was progressing. Uh, so why didn't Adam and Eve have more children? Well, it's entirely possible they did. We just don't know. Uh, it's very likely that they had daughters uh, because Cain had to marry somebody. Uh, and uh, it, it would have to have been his sister. Uh, there, there simply isn't any other answer. Uh, the brevity of the account uh, is uh, <laughs> a difficulty for us. For those of us who would like more details, this is difficult. Uh, and, uh, and we wonder why 130 years. Uh, in, uh, in this chapter, we see that uh, uh, people lived for quite a long time. Uh, the average age is around 900 years. Uh, and uh, that's, that's going to be the standard here. At the time of the, the flood, we're going to see lifespans reduced gradually from from a, a, a lifespan around uh, 900 years to a lifespan of under 200 years, and eventually settling out at around 120 years until into the actual Israel historical period when uh, lifespans uh, uh, averaged out at about 70 years. The presence of sin in the race seems to have had an effect on longevity, how long people lived. And we can't say exactly how that works, but it's it's interesting that the lifespan goes down. If we were to draw a graph of that, uh, we would see lifespans that start very high and on a hyperbolic curve gradually settle down to 70 years. So from around 900 years to around 70 years, uh, over a period of uh, several hundred years, uh, is uh, quite a decline. Uh, and it's the, uh, the kind of curve that you get with uh, the decay of something. If you take a ping pong ball and drop it from 
uh, the height of your shoulders onto a hardwood floor, it will bounce, but not quite as high. And the second bounce will be less high uh, until finally it's bouncing fairly quickly and it eventually stops on the floor and rolls someplace. Uh, if you were to measure the height of each of those bounces and the time between the bounces and plot that on a graph, you would get a hyperbolic decay curve. If you take that same uh, curve and apply it to other things that slowly wind down, uh, like uranium, for example, that decays uh, into... Uh, helium and and uh, 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 some other stuff, lead. Um, you would find the same curve. Uh, if you uh, if you buy a, a toaster oven down at the down at the mall and take it home and begin to use it, you will find it slowly wearing out, uh, and the rate of decay of a toaster oven is approximately a hyperbolic decay curve. Uh, this is the kind of thing that happens when things are wearing out. And it's, a, it's an expression of what we call the second law of thermodynamics. Everything in the world goes from a high energy useful stage to a low energy spent stage. Uh, and the relation between the two of them is a hyperbolic decay curve. Uh, that's, that's a fundamental law of, uh, of nature. Uh, God built that into the human race, apparently at the time of the fall. So for these first couple of thousand years, uh, people did live on long Time. Now, at this point, here in uh, chapter 5 and verse 3, uh, we're seeing uh, the, the beginnings of this genealogy. So we've got Seth in uh, verse 4. And the days of Adam after he became the father of Seth were 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters. It doesn't tell us how many or what their names were, but supposedly there were very many of them. Uh, and Adam lived another 800 years, so that's a total of 930 years. Now, I want you to notice something here. We've got um, we've got a, 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 a beginning point in the day when God created man. That's the zero point. At 130 years, this is presumably after Cain and Abel had both grown up, and, and there were also daughters born to Adam and Eve. I can't understand why there wouldn't be other sons, but the Bible doesn't tell us. Uh, after all this time, uh, Seth is born to, uh, to Adam. And then there was another 800 years, and Adam lived 930 years. That's, that's a pattern, and we're going to see that in all of the, the 10 patriarchs. Uh, the age of the father at the birth of the son, and then the additional years of the father. And if we plot that on a big piece of graph paper, uh, we'll find something really interesting. Uh, the, uh, the years can be plotted out, and we can add those years together uh, to get the number of years from the creation to the beginning of the flood. Uh, take the ten generations, and in our uh, English Bibles and in virtually all of our translations, this comes out to a, a total of about, oh, uh, well, let me look here, about 1,656 years. And that's that's perfectly reasonable, and I'm okay with that. And that will yield once we uh, once we establish dates for Abraham. Uh, 
2166 BC is a uh, well accepted date for the birth of Abraham. Uh, and now, uh, once we have analyzed the uh, chapter 11 genealogy, uh, we get a, uh, a date for the creation of uh, uh, 4004 BC, um, which is uh, not utterly unreasonable. It can be explained, but it's always provided difficulties uh, for scholars. We've got lots of difficulties and not nearly enough answers. Uh, so uh, some scholars have been working for for years now uh, with this problem, this particular problem. Uh, one of them is a fellow by the name of uh, Dr. Henry Smith, uh, who is a part of the uh, Creation Science Fellowship. Uh, and I will be meeting him in St. Louis in about a month. Uh, I'm kind of looking forward to that. Uh, I'm a part of the Creation Theology Fellowship. Uh, and uh, the three societies, the Creation Science Fellowship, the Creation Geology Fellowship, and the Creation Theology Fellowship uh, are are, are all meeting together uh, and we'll be talking about this. Anyway, Dr. Smith uh, wrote uh, wrote an article called The Case for the Septuagint Chronology of Genesis 5 and 11. <laughs> it's a really dull title. <laughs> you know, who cares? Uh, <laughs> but it's a fascinating article. And uh, what he suggests is that the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, uh, was... Uh, completed about 300 years before Christ. Our uh, standard Hebrew text uh, is the uh, Masoretic text, uh, and our our standard version is called the Leningrad Codex of the Masoretic text, which dates to around 800 AD, 800 years after the time of Christ. The Septuagint was translated from a Hebrew manuscript that we no longer have that dates to around 300 BC and maybe older than that. Uh, so it, the Septuagint then is a witness to uh, manuscript evidence that is easily 1,000 years older uh, than our best Hebrew manuscripts. So, should we listen to the Septuagint? Well, sometimes. Uh, the, uh, sometimes the Septuagint is just not very helpful. Uh, sometimes the Septuagint gives us really, really good information about uh, the New Testament uh, vocabulary, words in the New Testament that are also used in the Septuagint help us to understand how New Testament writers uh, understood the Old Testament Hebrew. I, and so that's very important and really useful. It's what I normally use the Septuagint for. The numbers in the Septuagint are often different than the numbers in the Masoretic Hebrew text. And particularly here in the genealogies of chapter 5 and chapter 11. We find that in several of these pre-flood patriarchs and in several of the pre-Abrahamic patriarchs, the date or, or the age at birth is a longer period in the, uh, uh, the Greek Septuagint than in the Hebrew Masoretic text. Uh, yeah, and uh, this is uh, on the order of 100 years older at the time of birth. The total age remains the same, but the age at birth is different. It's as though, perhaps, the uh, Hebrew has simply 
uh, omitted the hundreds place in some of the patriarchs. Not all of them, just some of them. I believe there are seven in the chapter five list. By the time we get to chapter 11, there are another half a dozen in that list that uh, uh, seem to have had a hundred years omitted. When you add all of this together, uh, it provides a, a different date for the flood. The, uh, the numbers are just a bit longer. It's on the order of 800 years. Uh, and this is, a, this is a very strange thing. So that would put the, uh, uh, the date of the flood, instead of 1656, uh, 2256, uh, after the creation. Now, what difference does that make? It's only 800 years. Um, true enough. It's only 800 years. But it solves some naughty, uh, difficult uh, historical problems for us. Uh, among other things, we we believe that uh, civilization began around 3,000 to 3,300 BC. If the uh, uh, if the Masoretic text is to be believed, uh, that uh, the the flood would have happened at around 2,500 BC, uh, which is really really close to the time of Abraham. Uh, it makes it very difficult to fit everything in that we know archaeologically and from uh, other history, including biblical history, had to have taken place. Uh, so while the, uh, uh, the uh, Hebrew date is possible, it makes better sense uh, to adapt a longer period between the creation and the flood. It allows for um, a bit more history to happen. Uh, so uh, 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 quite a number of young earth creation types, which is what I am, are moving to the Henry Smith uh, understanding of uh, these genealogies. And that's what I'm teaching here. Uh, I think uh, uh, what we have here uh, is a uh, a longer period of time, uh, uh, a total of, uh, uh, oh, let's see, from the Septuagint, from Shem to Terah, uh, da, 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 999 years. Okay, and that, that gives us a grand total of 3,248 years after creation. Uh, and uh, that gives us a 1,000 years uh, from the flood to the birth of Abraham, roughly, very roughly. And that makes better sense of the uh, development of civilization that we're going to see in chapters uh, 10 and 11. Uh, just makes it make better sense. So that provides a date for creation of very roughly 7,500 years ago, between 7,000 and 7,500 years ago. Uh, and that fits the archaeological record nicely. Uh, again, this is this is some inside baseball. Uh, this isn't something that most scholars care about. Uh, uh, I think it does make a difference when we're studying the history, uh, and uh, it allows us uh, to. Uh, handle the history of the period with uh, greater precision. So it's worth looking at, uh, and uh, so we bring it up today. Okay, let's see the rest of this. Uh, Adam became the uh, father of Seth. He had other sons and daughters, so all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Okay, I want to emphasize that. <laughs> and he died. This is the after uh, Cain killed Abel, this is the first death noted. Abel died because he was killed. Adam died because he is mortal. 
This is the mortality that God promised. Uh, and it is a, uh, uh, this becomes a litany, a, a, a repeated statement at each of them. So Seth lived 105 years, became the father of Enosh. And then Seth lived 800 years. Uh, and uh, 807 years after he became the father of Enosh, he had other sons and daughters. The days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. Enosh lived 90 years, became the father of Kenan. Enosh lived uh, 815 years after he became the father of Kenan and had other sons and daughters. You notice the, the repeated pattern? This uh, makes a passage easier to memorize. I know for us, it's hard to memorize, but if it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, the ancient world, people memorized these things. Most of the traditions passed down prior to the flood would have been oral, I think. Although there may have been some writing, we simply don't know. And then Enosh lived 800 years, after becoming the father of Kenan, had other sons and daughters, and all the days of Enosh were 905 years, and he died. Kenan lived 70 years, became the father of Mahalalel, and Kenan lived 840 years after becoming the father of Mahalalel, and he had other sons and daughters. Same pattern every time. All the days of Kenan were 910 years, and he died. Uh, and Mahalalel lived 65 years, became the father of Jared. Mahalalel lived 830 years. After he became the father of Jared, he had other sons and daughters. And all the days of Mahalalel were 895 years, and he died. Jared lived 162 years and became the father of Enoch. Jared lived 800 years after he became the father of Enoch, had sons and daughters. And all the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died. Enoch lived 65 years, became the father of Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God 300 years after he became the father of Methuselah, and he had other sons and daughters. And so all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Well, what happened? Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. It's a very interesting character. Uh, Enoch is the, uh, the first character in the Bible after Adam, uh, of whom it is said, he walked with God. We're told at the end of chapter 4 that in those days men began to call upon the name of the Lord. But Enoch is the first of whom it is actually said, he is a man who walked with God. Uh, and he was not. In other words, people were watching him, and all of a sudden he disappeared. He just wasn't there anymore. Uh, so what happened to him? That's explained with the phrase, for God took him. This is the first example in the Bible of what we normally call a translation. Later on, we're going to see probably Moses and probably Elijah translated directly into heaven. Uh, the, uh, the Bible says that at the uh, end of history, this will happen again uh, with believers who happen to be alive at the second coming of Christ. Instead of having to go through death at that time before our resurrection, we pass directly through resurrection into the presence of God. Uh, and that's what, that's what a translation is. Uh, it, uh, it's a bypassing of death. So Enoch is the first one ever to, to go through this. And we wonder, well, what, what exactly happens here? If we add up the age at birth and the number of years lived and chart them on a graph so that we can see when everything comes out, we're going to notice something interesting uh, that, among other things, Enoch, in his 365 years, 
uh, is translated out shortly before Noah's flood. Just before. It's like God knew what was coming and took Enoch out before the wrath of God was dispersed. This is a fascinating pattern. Uh, and uh, you wonder if this is the pattern that the the Paul is building his doctrine of the rapture on. Uh, uh, if, uh, if this is the kind of thing that God routinely does. Uh, at any rate, uh, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Now, Methuselah lived 187 years, became the father of Lamech, and Methuselah lived uh, uh, 782 years after he became the father of Lamech. He had other sons and daughters. All the days of Methuselah were 969 years, and he died. His death would have happened at the time of the flood. Uh, and uh, uh, Lamech lived 182 years, became the father of a son, called his name Noah, saying this one will give us rest from our work and from the toil of our hands, arising from the ground which the Lord has cursed. And Lamech lived 595 years after he became the father of Noah, and he had other sons and daughters. This also comes down to the time of the flood. So all the days of Lamech were 777 years, and he died. Noah was 500 years old, and he became the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So there's movement from Adam to Noah uh, over 10 generations, a, a total period of time of about 2,200 years. 2256 years in the Septuagint, uh, it takes us through a whole bunch of history. Uh, there's uh, uh, obviously a couple of thousand years of uh, history with all kinds of complex things going on. We're told in chapter four that uh, things like iron smelting and bronze uh, smelting were uh, real things uh, by this time. Uh, so there was a pre-flood civilization uh, about which we know very little besides what's in the Bible. Uh, we would not expect very much of that ancient civilization to have survived the flood. And what did survive would be deeply buried in sedimentary rock. And that's difficult to find. Uh, so we we really... We really don't have a lot of information besides what's in the Bible, which is why the biblical information is so precious. This, this gives us answers to questions that we would just have to live with otherwise. I want to get briefly, we've got 15 minutes, uh, and I, I want to get uh, a start uh, on the... Uh, the chapter of the flood. You know, probably we're just going to get a little bit of it done. Chapter 6 through chapter 11 really is one whole section of the book, uh, which uh, takes us down to the time of Abraham. Uh, and it uh, gives this, gives us the notion of, uh, of uh, judgment, uh, the judgment of God or the wrath of God is going to come down on uh, the world uh, in the form of a flood catastrophe. I use the term catastrophe uh, deliberately. Uh, the uh, the uh, um, secular scientists like to speak of uh, everything continuing as it did from the days of the fathers. Okay, in the words of uh, of Peter, Second Peter, um, but that's not true. Uh, the uh, The Earth shows us lots of evidence of catastrophic events, major, literally earth shaking events that have happened over the past ages, uh, and uh, these things uh, changed the shape of the Earth itself. 
uh, 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 we ought to be able to find them. So let's uh, let's look at chapter six. Uh, we'll begin at verse one. And it came about when men began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them. This is shortly after the creation. Okay, so when, when all of this happened, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. Okay. Um, now, on the face of it, that's, that's kind of strange, uh, but it's okay. It's not all that bad. So men began to multiply. Daughters were born to them. And, and the sons of God saw that the daughters of men. Now, what's the difference between sons of God and daughters of men? Well, daughters of men is easy. The, the daughters of men are human women. They, they have to be. But who are the sons of God? Now, the term is used later on for uh, godly people uh, in, in some, uh, some situations. Uh, uh, the Christians are called the sons of God. Uh, so one possibility is that the sons of God are the godly line or godly people in general, and that the daughters of men are the... Uh, women of the ungodly line, because whatever else we understand here, we've got to recognize that verse three follows, uh, and the verse three is is a picture of God's unhappiness with what has just happened. So there are some other options. Uh, the sons of God is a term that is also used in the Old Testament of the angels in heaven. Uh, the book of Job starts out with the, after we get done with the, uh, the story about how good a guy Job was, uh, we see that it came about in the passage of days that the sons of God were meeting together with God in heaven and Satan was among them. So the sons of God seems to include angels, uh, including Satan, uh, and perhaps others of his uh, uh, companions, okay, those were also the sons of God. We call this the uh, angel hypothesis. Uh, the, uh, uh, the human uh, uh, men hypothesis is just called the human men hypothesis. <laughs> so they could be tyrants. They could be really bad guys of some sort. They could be ordinary men. Uh, but we call that the uh, the human uh, sons of God hypothesis. I believe that the angels hypothesis makes better sense. Uh, it's difficult. Uh, there are things that we don't, definitely don't understand about that. Uh, how could angels do that since they are genderless? Uh, seriously? Uh, and the answer is we don't know. Uh, we have no real easy ways of, uh, of figuring that out and making sense of it. Uh, we do know that uh, the book of Jude and the book of Second Peter, which both speak of uh, primordial events, uh, speak of the angels who kept not their first estate, uh, but are rather held in prison awaiting the judgment of the end time. Okay, well, who were those angels and what did they do? Well, is it possible that these are the same angels? Uh, the simple answer, the best answer is we don't know, but it's one of the possibilities. Uh, uh, if if these are, in fact, angelic class beings, then it explains some of what we see farther into this chapter. And the Lord said, verse 3, My spirit will not strive with man forever. The term strive there is to struggle. 
as it's as though God is struggling with mankind, trying to decide what to do. Okay? And the message is, uh, man is just flesh. You know, I'm not going to strive with him forever. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. So there's a, a statement here of the reduction of man's lifespan from the 900 plus years of the pre-flood years uh, down to a more manageable 120 years. Uh, the reasons for that can only be understood as a part of the curse, an extension of the, uh, the curse of mortality. Uh, then we see in verse 4, this very difficult uh, passage, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Oh, <laughs> okay. Uh, who were these guys? If this is just human tyrants or men who took human women for wives, why were they, why were the uh, offspring of these marriages uh, so extraordinary? Uh, the uh, pagan literature in particular uh, delights in telling stories of uh, mighty men who were the uh, the children of a, a mating of uh, gods and uh, human women, so or vice versa, a goddess with a human man, uh, and the offspring is a half god, half man, demigod. Uh, people like Achilles and Odysseus and uh, Gilgamesh, uh, uh, various characters in the ancient world. And it's not just Greek and Roman culture, it's Babylonian culture and uh, Egyptian culture. They all have this notion uh, of a, a race of men who were half God and half man. Uh, perhaps what the Bible is doing here is explaining those particular characters. Um, yeah, I, I, for one, wish that the Bible told us a, just a bit more. Uh, the, at any rate, the angel hypothesis here for the sons of God uh, provides a few answers. It, it explains the pagan mythology of the, uh, uh, of the god men of the ancient world. Uh, uh, maybe it's just mythology. Um, and, uh, I think for the most part, it's not the least bit accurate. Uh, but there seems to be a very widespread memory in the human race of a period of time when there were half God, half man characters walking around on the earth. Uh, were these the Nephilim? The word simply means shades. Uh, it, it doesn't necessarily mean giants. Uh, some people think the Nephilim have to be giants. I don't think that's necessarily true. Mighty men of renown. All right. Well, anyway, uh, and the Lord saw, he's looking down from his heaven, and he's involved. He saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that Every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's an extremely strong statement. Every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. This is the first diagnosis of what uh, John Calvin, thousands of years later, would call total depravity. The idea of total depravity is that every part of every man is affected by sin. Uh, and if left to his own devices, man would eventually become completely evil. Uh, and the, the picture here that God is giving us is of a universe of, of an earth itself, of a mankind, where there is 
no possibility of redemption. Okay, where where mankind has no positive influence and each and every one has become as evil as he could possibly be. Every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, we're nowhere close to that. Now, there are some people who are there, but they, as, uh, as a race, we're nowhere close to that. Uh, but at, at this time, just prior to the flood, that's what God saw. Verse 6, and the Lord was sorry. He had sorrow. Uh, it broke his heart, literally. Uh, he, had, he was sorry that he had made man on the earth. He was grieved in his heart. Okay, I want to take a second for that word, grief. Uh, because over in the New Testament, and uh, the uh, the end of the First Thessalonian epistle, uh, Paul says, whatever you do, grieve not the Spirit of God. Uh, it is a bad idea to give God grief, in other words. Well, how do we know that? Because the last time that the Spirit of God was grieved, the result was a worldwide catastrophe, the flood. Uh, the, the Lord was sorry. He had sorrow that he had made man. He was grieved in his heart. And so he responds, verse 7, very, very important verse if we're going to try to understand what's really going on here. Uh, the Lord said, I will blot out man. To blot out is uh, like, a, like a paper towel uh, wiping a, a, a dish just out of the sink. Okay, you're trying to blot up all that water, and you know you've gotten the job done when the dish is dry. You've blotted it all up. If the dish is still half wet, you're not done yet. That's, that's what it means to blot out everything that's there, to wipe clean. God's intention was to destroy the entire human race. Blot out man that I've created from the face of the land. Uh, and then he expands this from man to animals to creeping things and to the birds of the sky. For I'm sorry I've made them. So his intention is to send a catastrophic death on the entire planet. Every place where man has gone, every place where any of the animals have gone, there will be a catastrophic death. Okay, it's important to understand that uh, because this is a uh, this is a uh, a way of understanding the wrath of God. The wrath of God is the just, angry response of God to the presence of sin in creation. The just angry response of God to the presence of sin in his creation. We have to understand that because the, the wrath of God is not some uh, small thing. This is, in fact, huge. And the entire human race, because of the fall, was influenced by sin in every part of their being, and they were gradually becoming completely engulfed by sin. But then we see verse 8, and when we get together again next time, I'm going to I'll show you a diagram so you'll understand what, they, what is going on here. Verse 8, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. The word favor here is the Hebrew word chen. Uh, you could put a C on it and call it chen. Okay, C-H-E-N or H-E-N. Uh, we normally trans this, uh, translate this word grace. Grace or favor uh, is an unmerited provision 
of resources which the sinner could never provide for himself. Noah didn't stand out from the rest of the world because of his massive righteousness. Noah was different because he found grace. Noah wasn't rewarded with grace because of his great holiness. The previous verse tells us that every inclination of the thoughts of his, mankind's heart, was only evil continually, and that includes Noah. Noah wasn't rewarded for being a righteous man. Noah became a righteous man because of the grace of God. I want you to kind of soak that in for a while. This is extraordinarily strong language. Uh, and it, uh, it clarifies what salvation is, in fact, all about. Noah didn't earn his place on the ark. Noah received a place on the ark by the grace of God and became a righteous man as a result of that grace. Uh, next week, we'll see how that, that all works out, and I'll show you some, some more that'll help it work. But we'll stop right there at, at verse 8, and we'll come back and see that again. Next time, let's see if I can stop that. Okay. Guys, thank you for being here. Oh, look at me. Look who all is there. Uh, so good to see you all. I'm looking forward uh, to seeing all my Italian friends uh, when I get to Italy in August. Uh, I've got the, uh, the plane tickets. I'm working out a, a train ride from Cosenza to Casanetica. <laughs> That's going to be fun. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing everybody. Bring your families. Uh, bring everybody. Let's uh, let's eat together. Let's sing together. We'll 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 look at the Bible together. I'm looking forward to that. God bless everybody. We'll see you next time. Let me uh, let me get our. I want to ask everybody to unmute so we can say goodbye to each other. But uh, thank you all for coming. Love y'all. Um, thank you, Doctor John. To, uh, to next time. Thank you. Uh, we'll bye -bye. Uh, stay up to date. Here, Ciao. Right. See you there, man. Uh, take care. Love that background. Ciao to the... <laughs> yeah, that's a yeah. hey, Oscar. Ciao, ciao. Yeah. Ciao, ciao. All right. Ciao a tutti. Love you all, guys. Bye bye.